Hello everybody. What I am driving today is a car that is considerably rarer than may first appear. This is a Mark I Audi TT, a car that caused a storm when it was launched back in 1998, becoming an instant hit for the firm and a bit of an icon. But that joy soon turned to panic as it was discovered the TT had some inherent and potentially fatal flaws. And what makes this particular car so special is that it's one of a handful of small cars still remaining that were never recalled and fixed by Audi. So what we have here is the original Audi TT as it was first seen a quarter of a century ago. But is there a reason I should be scared? Well. Let's find out in today's episode of JM on Cars. The 1990s was a very exciting period for Audi. The company was undergoing quite the change with the 80 and 100 lineup becoming the A4 and A6, the incredibly popular A3 then landing, and of course, this. Styled by Freeman Thomas and Jay Mays, the people behind what became the new Beetle, the TT was first seen in 1994 as a roadster, but then made a real splash in 1995 when it appeared at the Frankfurt Motor Show. And this was a car that, for whatever reason, really captured the spirit of the moment. Though officially speaking a concept, it garnered enough attention it was decided the car had to go in production. And just three years later it was then released, effectively unchanged. And as soon as it landed, people were desperate to get their hands on it. In fact, so fashionable was this car that here in Britain, where we didn't get it until 1999, people that couldn't wait actually began to import them. Yeah, crazy to think I know, people importing Audi TTs, but such was the stir that this car caused. And though I think today familiarity has bred complacency, you've got to remember, back in the 1990s, this would have been a revolutionary design. And the car in many ways followed the same formula as that of the Corrado and Scirocco many years earlier, taking the nice, sensible underpinnings of the contemporary Golf and mixing it with a somewhat more interesting looking body shell, giving you a car that should be nice, easy, practical and good to live with, but still turns a few heads. In fact, so dedicated were Audi to making sure that the concept shape translated to reality, they even developed new welding techniques to make sure it appeared as seamless and futuristic as it had on that trade show stand in 1995. And I've got to say, I think it's actually a good looking car. Not a great looking car, but good. And Graham, the owner, I think rightly points out that it's not meant to be overtly sporting. Instead, it's meant to be interesting. And I really think that it is. If anything, I think this original car, when viewed from the side, does actually bear something of a resemblance to the Beetle. It's got that overall vibe about it. And uh, let's be honest here, this I think was a far, far more successful car, particularly critically, than the new Beetle. That um, didn't go so well, did it? So badly, in fact, did the new Beetle go down that here in Britain, most people aren't aware they actually tried it again with the new Beetle confusingly now called the Beetle that replaced the new Beetle. Don't ask. The Americans bought it though. To begin with, the engine option was VW's venerable 1.8 litre turbocharged four cylinder with five valves each for a total of 20. And you could have it either as a 180 horsepower unit as we have here with either front or all wheel drive, naturally branded Quattro, or as a 225 horsepower unit with Quattro as standard. And if you're looking for a way to easily distinguish the 180 and 225 variants of the car, check the back, where the 180 has just a single exit exhaust and the 225 a far better looking pair. Later, the range was then expanded to include some lower powered variants of this engine and also a 3.2 litre VR6, as you would have seen in the Golf R32 of the time. Many of you may in fact recall that car specifically, not for its engine, but instead its gearbox, because it was with the 3.2 litre TT that VAG introduced to the world their DSG gearbox, a twin clutch unit and I believe the first of its kind sold to the public. 
Though people continue to argue as to whether the VR6 is actually worth it, it makes a little more power, around 240 horses, but at the expense of extra weight, the gearbox was revolutionary, and it featured in a very memorable Top Gear where Jeremy Clarkson declared it the first car with a flappy paddle gearbox that actually made sense. So in a great many ways, this was a truly revolutionary car. On the subject of gearboxes, one little tidbit of information I was given by this car's owner, Graham, who recently has developed a bit of a fondness for the original TT, is that it was actually available with an automatic before the arrival of the DSG, a traditional torque converter, and certainly here in Britain, something of a rarity. But it does exist, which until recently, I wasn't even aware of. This car, as it happens, comes with the 180's default transmission option, a 5-speed manual, with a 6 being optional and standard on the 225. So far, so good. You've got a decent, futuristic-looking car with a solid, if by today's standard, slightly cheap and somewhat unremarkable interior. That is, unless you opted for the baseball glove option that looks exactly like it sounds. I'll put a picture up. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, can you imagine Audi doing that today? I can't. The engine, again, easy to forget in 2024, but 225 horses? That was more than a Golf GTI made. In fact, that was more than a Golf GTI made for a good few years after. So all in then, the car really had quite a bit going for it. And then it started killing people. A number of very high-profile accidents occurred, particularly in its home country of Germany, where, when on the Autobahn at high speed, it turned out this beautiful shape produced a rather unstable car. As soon as it was obvious that things were going wrong, a bit of investigation work took place, and it was discovered that this car produced twice as much lift as a Porsche Boxster, and because of the way the rear is designed, it was also particularly susceptible to crosswinds. In one notable example, in 2000, an ex Wartburg factory rally driver died whilst driving his. Though one part of the story that many people chose to leave out was the fact he was doing 120 mile an hour on the equivalent of a B road on winter tyres. Still, when you're a company like Audi, which at this time would still have been able to remember the controversy that they had in the USA with the car we called the 100, and I think they called the 5000. If you haven't heard of that, look it up. It's equal parts terrifying and hilarious. But this was an issue for the company and they needed to fix it fast. And so they went to task trying to sort the TT's issues. Oh, and in case you were wondering, there isn't actually an official explanation for where the name came from. Some people believe it is a reference to NSU, one of the companies from which Audi was born, and their success on the Isle of Man TT circuit with their motorcycles way back when. Others suggest it means tradition and technique, two things that Audi stands for, and a couple of people said it meant twin turbo, but um, as no twin turbo TT was ever made in the entirety of the car's life, I think we can discount that. But let's wind the clock back to 1999, and all of a sudden, the wind has been taken from Audi's sails because their smash hit is now a big, big problem. The news reports are coming through thick and fast, and naturally, customers are very, very worried. It doesn't really matter that here in Britain, there is essentially nowhere you can do 110 mile an hour. You don't want a car with a reputation for dangerous handling. Just ask Mercedes, who had it with both the original A-Class and the smart car. This hurts sales. And ultimately, car companies, they are all about making money. Credit where credit is due, though. The program that Audi put together was delivered in both a timely fashion, available from mid-1999 onwards, and comprehensive. And for the 48,500 people that had already taken delivery of their TT, they were offered the option of, at no cost, taking any one of a number of fixes that the company had put into place. The most obvious of which, and the one you may have already spotted, is the fitment of a rear wing. A little lip spoiler that, in years to come, actually became a sort of defining feature of the first gen TT but one that Graham really doesn't like, because as far as he sees it, that implies a sporting character the car was never really designed to have. Cool, blimey, a Honda E. Never seen one of them around here. That's because they're about 30 miles away from the nearest charging point. 
Anyway, next up was a comprehensive reworking of the suspension, which altered the characteristics of both the front and rear, and ultimately aimed to ease the car's tendency to lift off oversteer, which, for a four-wheel drive car, is quite an impressive feat. But the most significant change actually came in the form of a new stability control system, which had to be essentially engineered from the ground up, and then to fit to cars required sending them all the way back to the factory, where they had to be fitted with a new wiring loom. And this was a big, big job. All in, fixing the TTs that they'd sold up until that point cost the company some 800 million euro but evidently didn't stop the riotous success that the car was, and it went on to be a smash hit for the next quarter of a century, having just recently only taken its retirement after three separate generations. Latterly, the TT has developed something of a reputation as a hairdresser's car, maybe assisted by the fact that in the early days it was essentially a fashion accessory. I've always had a little bit of a fondness for it, maybe because way back when my mum had a Mark 1 TT 225 convertible that did feature on the channel a couple of times. I even took it around Blyton Park. Probably shouldn't have done, but I did. And uh, that was a nice car, because to be honest, any convertible is a lovely thing. But this car, though, forms a part of a very small collection, currently consisting of three cars. And what unites all of them is that they are members of the very, very early spoilerless generation. So vehicles from 1998 and the first half of 1999. As you might imagine, everything that came out of the factory from sort of 99 onwards was fitted with all of the fixes required making these a very rare thing. As you might imagine, when people were offered at no cost to have their potentially lethal car made less lethal, most of them took Audi up on the offer. And it was only after he had begun acquiring a few of these cars that Graham actually learned, simply because it doesn't have the spoiler on the back, it doesn't mean it hasn't had the other fixes performed too. And this left him rather disappointed because he bought this car thinking it was an as original example and he hoped to get the original TT experience. He was then delighted as he got under it to do some work to it and found that's exactly what he had. The giveaways were twofold. First off, all of the wishbone specifications, bushes and the like, matched that of the original cars. The difference is significant. Secondly, and should you be interested, this is an easy way to tell, the car does not have an ESP switch on the dash. It's just got a blank button. Either side, were the car equipped with them, you'd have had the option for a heated seat, which I do recall in the Mark 1 TT had a ludicrous number of settings. There's like six or seven different settings for the heated seat, and that's just mad but one of the car's quirks as is the obsession with sort of golf ball style dimples on just about everything but you know what i'm never really going to complain about a company particularly one such as audi trying something a little different though as you can probably tell this car was picked up somewhat cheaply off ebay as a project cosmetically it still needs a little bit of work but mechanically it is in reasonably fine order so now you know a little bit about the story behind the original TT. All these years later, what's it like to drive? You know something? It's actually a real surprise. These were never ever meant to be the final word in handling excitement or driver engagement. For that, you'd have spent your money on a Lotus Elise instead. But when you do encounter an example like this, which has had a little bit of mechanical sympathy thrown its way, you begin to realize that actually, they're quite a bit better than you probably remember. The reason for that being that today, at near a quarter of a century old for some of them, most Mark 1 TTs are a little bit tired. And the fact is, because they are such a cheap car to buy, most people are unwilling to do the work necessary to bring them up to the standard that they really deserve. It is for that reason that both Graham and myself consider this to be a genuine future classic. And if you do want to buy a car as an investment you can still enjoy, you could do a lot worse than this. And there is something to be said for his logic of buying these early spoilerless examples. Dangerous reputation though they may have, actually with 
modern tyres and a little bit of sympathy in the driving department, I don't think you've really got all that much to worry about. No, I wouldn't take one on the Autobahn, but that's fine. We don't have any of those in Britain, sadly. Yes, I know I could take it to the Isle of Man, but you're just not going to, are you? The steering is a little inert, as is typical for many a VAG product. Thanks to the Quattro all-wheel drive system, grip is actually pretty good, even today, with the roads being quite greasy. One thing I will say, though, the car is certainly a lot firmer than I expected. You'd imagine this to be a, a more cosseting, more comforting ride, particularly in 180 horsepower, guys. But it's not very, very firm this, and it does struggle with some of the lumps and bumps in the road. When really pressing on, I think it could even cause an issue or two, because the car, I think, might just skip. Today, the conditions just aren't really good enough to really press on, but it is unfortunate that. It does take a little bit of the enjoyment out of it for me. Though both Graham and myself, again, would prefer a six-speed manual over this five, it's still decent enough. The action of the shift is quite pleasant, and when you're on country roads with a speed limit of about 60, it's actually perfectly fine. The steering rack itself is a little on the slow side, but I have been driving a lot of Italian exotic stuff lately, and those are particularly keen. The engine is still fairly strong, and though it doesn't really have much interest in revving all the way out to its six and a half grand red line, it's functional, decent, gives you that low down torque you'd want from something with a turbo and it's pleasant enough. There is a good reason. I haven't rigged up an exhaust camera today and that's because there's not really much noise to appreciate. If you want a TT to listen to, that's got to be the VR6 and they do make a very nice noise. They also, I think, look pretty good. They're a little more aggressive and in a nice leery colour, like the orange of the one that I drove. I think they're fantastic. You also, when buying a TT, do actually have a choice of two rather dramatically different body styles, because here in Coupe, guys, it's a 2 plus 2, with, if you need it, a very generous boot. Fold those seats down and you've actually got a lot of space in here. Or, if you go for the Roadster, it's then a strict two-seater with a lot less space, but of course, that nice wind in the hair feeling. And both, really, are quite good options. The car uses quite a bit of aluminium in its construction, which is something that Audi were really pushing quite hard at the time. It's not an aluminium chassis, as you would have got with the A8 or even the A2, but still, it's good enough. However, in Roadster guys, you do notice the lack of rigidity. It is a fairly wobbly car, and so those really are best experienced pootling along. If you want something to drive, it's got to be the coupe. Of course, you can still maintain these fairly easily. Bits are readily available, not too expensive, and there are plenty of specialists out there. The only thing I've noticed thus far with this car is there's a rattle from the exhaust. Easily sorted, I'm sure, but just a bit frustrating. On a run, they will do reasonable fuel economy, not spectacular. This one is currently recording an average of 29.1, but that is after having driven it vigorously for a little bit. And I do know that on longer journeys, over 30 will be achievable, which again is not great, but if you're talking about a sports car, it's okay. The issue is, of course, that it's not really a sports car. However, if you're at peace with that, it is a good car. And I think right about now is the time to get into one of these because this is the stage where people still consider them to be a common and essentially disposable thing. There's no point, as far as people are concerned, spending money keeping one of these going when you could just buy another one for less money instead. And that is when they start to become really, really rare. And I think this is definitely a car worth preserving. It was Audi doing something a little bit different. Something that sadly, in later years, they kind of gave up. Anyway, that was a look at, I think, a rather cool car. A genuine, original, unmodified Audi TT. I quite like it. How would you have yours? As intended by the designers or with the later modifications made to it? Do you prefer the more aggressive spoiler, the look of it, the idea that you won't die if you do 120 mile an hour? Hop into the comments section, let me know. And while you're doing that, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe too. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.